a little siesta with Jason out there while you were out doing other things. It was quite pleasant, very nice little um, breeze coming along and the, and the shade was lovely. So we have another afternoon before us and we're going to have a, a look at Revelation 16, 17 and 18 uh, in this uh, afternoon period. And of course Revelation 16 deals with the vials of the wrath of God. And as you see we've titled this the study Preliminary and Final Judgment on the Seat of the Beast. And that's because the judgments of God began uh, on the system of the beast uh, back in 1789. We need to bear that in mind. God has already been at work bringing judgment upon this system. Thus far, he has used men through the work of the angels, men like Napoleon, for example, and we'll talk about him. But... For the seventh vial of the wrath of God, he is going to use the saints uh, via Israel, uh, returning uh, under Elijah. So it's very important for us to see that at the outset, because we know that the, uh, that the structure of the apocalypse looks like this. Uh, when we have this uh, telescopic uh, unfolding, the continuous historical interpretation of the apocalypse, and we now, of course, sit up here at the end of the sixth vial. The, the very last event of the sixth vial is the gathering of the nations into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the actual events of Armageddon begin the pouring out of the seventh vial of the wrath of God and therefore you've got the seven thunder judgments in that period uh, of the seventh vial. So that's where we sit in the scheme of things. So the things we're going to talk about uh, today are very much uh, in front of us, immediately in front of us, and we expect them to unfold very soon. Now, we were talking a little earlier today about the rise of, Constant, of, of Constantine, or was that yesterday? I forget now. <laughs> uh, and, uh, of course, that was the very first great earthquake. The, the things that were accomplished by the rise of Constantine uh, was the first great earthquake of the apocalypse. And there are three great earthquakes in the apocalypse. The other two, of course, uh, are the French Revolution and the beginning of the vials of the wrath of God in Revelation 11, verse 13. We read about that great earthquake. And the pouring out of the seventh vial in Revelation chapter 16, verses 17 and 18... That's the third great earthquake. Now, we're not talking about literal earthquakes here, are we? We're talking about political earthquakes. This was a great political earthquake, as we saw earlier in our studies. This was a huge earthquake, and, of course, the one that's coming very soon will be another great earthquake that will see the end of Nimrod's system uh, in the earth. So we're going to have a look at these uh, two, two great earthquakes uh, in our sessions uh, this afternoon. So here's a summary of Revelation 15 and 16 and you need to see these two chapters together <clears throat> because if you look at Revelation 15 it says in verse 1 that I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvellous, seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them is filled up the wrath of God and of course those vials of the wrath of God are then poured out in chapter 16 and you'll notice it says... <clears throat> If you have a look at verse, uh, verse 5 of Revelation 15, and after that I looked and behold the temple, the, the word, the idea there is the nave, that is the most holy place of the temple uh, of the testimony, was open. And seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. Can someone suggest to me, who it might be talking about when it talks about these seven angels coming out clothed in pure and white linen? Well, that's the language that's used of the saints, isn't it? In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. And then we're told later on in Revelation 19 that these who are wearing robes of pure and white linen ride upon horses in the wake of the one who rides upon a white horse, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you might say, but hang on, the saints were not involved in the work of the, of the first six vials. Well, no, they weren't. The angels were, but you see, the angels were actually representing us. 
We obviously couldn't be there. But the angels were doing that work from the times of the French Revolution, 1789, right down to now. And they will retire, so to speak, and hand over their tasks to the saints for the seventh vial. But when this is written by Christ, he writes it in this way because he wants you to see that you, the saints, were being represented by the angels in the work of the French Revolution. In fact, that was your work. If you're going to be in the work of the seventh vial, you were actually, in a sense, there at the first vial of the wrath of God. You just didn't realise it, that's all. But those angels were there to represent you. That's why that language is written in that way. And you go on to read verse 7. And here's your proof. Verse 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. So who are the four living creatures? Well, that's the cherubim of Revelation chapter 4, isn't it? That's the, that's the saints in their military role in the establishment of the kingdom. So the very way this is structured is designed to, for us to see that we are privileged to be involved in this. We're going to be involved literally in the seventh vial, but there is a very real sense in which we were involved in those works that were done from the time of the French Revolution by the angels who represented the saints uh, in that work. It goes on to talk then about the, the temple, the nave being filled with smoke from the glory of God, etc. And uh, no one was able to enter till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So these two chapters have to be seen together. <coughs> chapter 15 is the introduction to chapter 16. Uh, and so when you look at this section of scripture, this is the way you would summarise it. And we can see, of course, in the green here, the vials as they're poured out progressively right down to the seventh. And we're, we're sitting here in the scheme of things. This is where we're sitting, just before the pouring out of the seventh vial of the wrath of God. So Revelation 16, verse 1, introduces us to this first vial. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And I think we're all aware that this is the beginning of the French Revolution and we're going to talk briefly about that. Now, this is the study that I had to uh, trim down a little bit because at the end of this study we're going to be talking about 2060. Uh, and I've taken out of it that which is going to be repeated anyway uh, this evening in the video. In the video we're going to be looking at the vials of the wrath of God and some of the works of Napoleon, etc. Uh, and uh, you'll also see a section there uh, on the sixth vial and the work of Cyrus the Great of old, which also is typical of the work of Christ and the saints. And I'll, I'll say a, a few things about that briefly later on. Uh, but I'll need to do that because uh, we want to make the bridge between what I've taken out and what you're going to see uh, this evening. So here they are, the vials of the wrath of God poured out. 1789 is the first vial. Then we've got the second vial, which has to do with the activity of, of the, the British on the sea. Now you might think, well, hang on. Some would say, well, what's the British got to do with this? Well, the British played a very, very important part because they locked Napoleon in Europe. He had ideas of invading Britain in 1805. British Navy, of course under Admiral Nelson, defeated uh, the Spanish and, and French fleets, which were much larger than his fleet. He defeated them, and so Napoleon had to abandon his invasion of Britain, just like Hitler later on had to abandon his invasion of Britain because the Luftwaffe weren't able to defeat the British Air Force. So history repeated itself. And he was forced to go east, and when he went east, he fought probably, he thought anyway, his greatest battle, the Battle of Austerlitz, and you'll see a bit about that tonight. Um, and God locked him by, by the British keeping him confined in you he locked him where he wanted him and Napoleon was always trying to get somewhere else I mean he went to Egypt in 1798 God didn't want him in Egypt what are you doing over there you idiot and so it was a failure it was a military success but a failure uh, in terms of strategy and he was forced to flee from Egypt 
He tries to invade Britain because God says, no, don't do that. He ends up marrying the daughter of, of the uh, Emperor of Austria, who was a Catholic. And, of course, that was the, the last straw for God. And that's why in 1812, when he invaded Russia, God didn't want him to attack Russia. It was a disaster. He took 600,000 men to Russia and only 100,000 returned. All the rest either perished uh, in the cold or in the battles or were chewed up by the Cossacks. They didn't get out. They, they didn't get home. In fact, Napoleon lost three million men dead in the course of his brief career. Three million men perished uh, fighting for him. So he was, uh, in many ways, I mean, he, he said he was an instrument of providence, as you'll see tonight, and he was, but like all human beings, he really didn't, he didn't understand why he was being used, but he was raised up for one single purpose, and that was to bring judgments upon the Catholic harlot of Europe. And he did a pretty good job of that as well. So in the work of Napoleon, we have the third, fourth, and fifth Bibles. And then we have the sixth Bible. Now the question arises, why is there such a huge gap between the sixth vial and the seventh vial? And we're going to answer that question a little later on. We're going to answer why it is necessary for this period from 1820 to what will be, of course, uh, something in our era, the return of Christ and the pouring out of the seventh vial. There is a, a very reasonable answer to that question. And then, of course, comes the seventh thunder judgments, that last great earthquake. So there's the vial set out in a chart form. Now what we're going to find, and we, this is a very brief consideration, we'd normally spend five or six sessions dealing with the vials of the wrath of God at least. What we are going to find though in our brief consideration is that prophecy is the mould into which history is poured. In other words when the prophecy is given that's what's going to happen. Whatever God prophesies that's what happens. He makes sure it happens. And of course, obviously, he has foreknowledge. But prophecy is the mould into which history is poured. And so you can see an exactitude in the way that these things that Christ spoke through John way back in AD 96 were fulfilled. And there is a real exactitude in it. So let's just have a look at the empire of Charlemagne. The Holy Roman Empire passed through many phases from its beginning in 800 AD to its demise in 1806 when Francis II, Emperor of the HRE, abdicated after the Battle of Austerlitz. At the time of the French Revolution in 1789, France was allied to the Holy Roman Emperor but was an independent monarchy. Its king married the daughter of the Emperor, which is may be a reason why Napoleon himself ended up marrying eventually Maria, the daughter of Francis I as he became after he ceased to be the emperor of the HRE. But there is the territory of the, of the HRE and France was here over on the western side it was effectively part of it but an independent country. But you see this is the area that's described as the earth the, the Holy Roman Empire was, of course, the beast of the earth. This is that area, the earth. And what about this man, Napoleon? You know, I haven't said anything about the French Revolution much, have I? You have to wait to the movie tonight to see a little bit about that. Um, but it was a very important event, obviously, but, but uh, that will be in the, in the thing tonight. Napoleon is the one I want to focus on. <clears throat> How did he come to power? After the reign of terror had ended in 1794, Napoleon tried to stay above the turmoil of French politics. Anyone know how old he was when the French Revolution began? 20. So if the French Revolution began in, in uh, 1789, he's 25. He's 25 in 1794. Now, I think... Probably there's quite a few people in this room that, you know, there's a few people in this room, around 25 few. Okay, you reckon you could do what Napoleon did? You reckon you'd become one of the most famous generals? Bear in mind the handicaps. He was a Corsica. He wasn't French. He didn't speak French very well. 
but he became the emperor of the French by age 30. Think about that. Corsica. Now, it's obvious that God had a purpose for this man, and if you read his history, you find that he escaped death on many occasions. I mean, when he was fighting at Toulon against the British, for example, he was above the parapets for so long. He should have been like, like Swiss cheese. He should have had that, that many holes in him through bullets. But he didn't get any. There was, a, there was a time when he was leading an army across a very narrow bridge. Nearly everybody around him got shot, including his aide-de-camp. He didn't get shot. How come? Well, because God had a work for him to say. There was an angel protecting this man, I believe, because God had a work for him. So this is a remarkable case of the way that the angels can work to bring forth the fulfilment of Bible prophecy. Well, in 1795, he was invited by the Directory, which was, of course, the, the ruling body of the French after the Reign of Terror, when they, when they got rid of uh, some of the more awful characters um, and, and used the guillotine on them, as they had used the guillotine on others. <coughs> But he was asked to suppress a number of internal revolts. And there was one where the monarchists were trying to bring back the monarchy, you see. And they brought all this, these people along. And there were women and men. And they all had sort of pitchforks. And some had guns. Well, he, he was in charge of, of an army division. And uh, he set it up so that they just butchered. They absolutely butchered that mob. And, of course, then the directory realised that he was a pretty important guy. He had an ability that very few had. But then he success, they sent him down to fight on the Italian front. Now his success on the Italian front in 1796 to 97 was just nothing short of remarkable. So we're going to see he won 26 battles there. Never lost one. And he got, came close to it a couple of times. He never lost a battle. It clearly marked him out for future leadership. And because of his success in Italy, he created what's known as the Cispadane Republic in Italy. And, of course, typical of Napoleon, declared himself to be president of that republic without, of course, the authority of the directory at home. <laughs> so he, he was showing that he was prepared to put himself forward for leadership. In 1799, he formed an alliance with some leading politicians and overthrew the directory. Now, there were three of them. The other two were older men who, of course, he very quickly elbowed out of the way. And so he became, in the end the ruler of France at age 30. By 1804, 2nd December actually, 1804, he was crowned emperor. In fact, he was made emperor in May 1804, but he was crowned emperor uh, in December 1804. He was now 35 years of age and basically the ruler of Europe. Incredible, absolutely incredible rise to power. Became the first consul, as I said, and ruled that, that uh, directory at age 30. So what about his brilliant early career? In March 1796, at age 26, he became the general of the army of Italy. He fought seven campaigns against the Austrian power in Italy between 1796 and 1800. He won 26 battles in 1796 and 1797 alone. Now, when he arrived down in the south of France to take over control of that army, he turned up and he, his first question was to the cavalry, where are your horses? And they said, we've eaten them. There was no food for the army. There was no clothing for the army. There were no weapons much for the army. And they sent him down there to fight the Austrians in Italy. He had a lot of, lot of work to do to restore that army to some kind of respectability. Uh, and, of course, he set about that work. So why? Why would God raise up a man like this? Well, we're told. We're told in Revelation 16 and at verse 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. So the judgments of God avenging the persecution of the remnant and the faithful begin with the French Revolution. 
That's when that begins. So never think that these people get away with it. They didn't get away with it. They haven't been, haven't been allowed to get away with it. God has been bringing judgments upon that system since the French Revolution. And why did he do that? Well, because of all that they did. They slaughtered a whole range of people. Now, I think you might have seen some pictures come up there. Did you see those pictures? You've got uh, the treatment of um, people here, uh, rather brutal treatment. You've got being, people being beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And, of course, you've got the slaughter of the Waldenses in the Piedmont. I want to talk about the Piedmont in particular because this is the area of the Piedmont. See that? Piedmont. Now what happened was that Napoleon was sent down here to Toulon. I'm going to see that in a minute. This is the area described here in Revelation 16 as the place of the rivers and fountains of waters. You just step back with me to verse 4. Verse 4 is the third vial. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. All of the great rivers of Europe, most of them anyway, Rome, Rhine, Danube, Po, rise in this region. Because this, of course, if you've ever flown over there, you're even summertime, it's a bit like flying over the mountains in parts of Canada, and I guess in America, still snow on the mountains. At the end of summer, well, this is the area of the, the Alpine region, uh, mainly, of course, in Switzerland and northern Italy, parts of Austria, and a bit of France. This is the ski region of Europe today. It's where people go to ski. This is why there are so many lakes and streams and rivers that rise there. Very rich area in terms of where you can actually live, very rich. And so the Waldenses, who were a, a sect or a group of people who stood apart from the Catholic system, they were brutalised. Now we don't know whether or not these people had the truth or, or part of them had, we don't know that. That will be revealed later on. But one thing we do know is that probably, probably there was some kind of truth there that because the judgments of God came upon this system, he says, because they've shed the blood, and they shed a lot of blood here, did the Catholics, uh, in this area of the Piedmont and the Alpine regions. That's where the judgments were to fall. So let's have a look and see what happened. Napoleon revised the French army in 1796. He was made, he was made the general of the army down here in Toulon, it was based. So having spent some time repairing it, he then marched into Italy in 1796. He encountered the Austrians in force and defeated them. They thought, well, we'll just retire and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, get him next time. Well, they did that, but then he defeated them again. Well, they thought, oh, well, you know, he, he's, he's been lucky. He, he won't be able to ch chase us back to Austria. Well, guess what he did? He chased them back to Austria. And they got very, very worried. And then, of course, he turned on Italy. And what happened then was that over the course of the next two years, in a series of 26 battles, which he won every single one brilliantly, he, he made blood to flow in Italy. He gave them blood to drink, just as we are told here in Revelation 16. Quite a remarkable piece of history that when you look at it and consider where he came from. Now the Pope didn't like this at all, did he? So he decided that he would put together an army. So after defeating the Austrians in Lombardy, Napoleon turned on the papacy and the Pope gathered an army of fanatical peasants and attacked the French, but he was defeated in a couple of very, uh, very, very bloodthirsty battles at Faenza and Ancona. And Napoleon then advanced on Rome and the Pope sued for peace and an enormous ransom was laid on him and the utterly humiliating terms of the treaty that he was granted. So the Pope was given blood to drink and the papacy, papacy and its adherents drank blood but worse for them was to come later in the fifth vile judgments uh, that were poured out again by Napoleon. Now in the final phase of the third vial 
after his triumph in Italy, Napoleon looked for new conquests and decided on Egypt in 1798. You know, he's one of these people who wanted to do, he wanted to be out there and do something. And nothing was happening. He had control of Italy. Things were quiet at home in France. So what am I going to do? Well, how about we clobber the Egyptians? How about we take over the Middle East? You know why he did that? Napoleon was a friend of the Jews. There were very few people in history who are friends of the Jews. Napoleon was a friend of the Jews. And that's why Brother Thomas treats him as a type of Christ for a number of other reasons as well. Though mutually successful, the campaign was a disaster due to Britain's supremacy on the sea. And so Nelson was down there uh, uh, and uh, in the, the Battle of the Nile, it's called, at Abu Kur in, Italy, in, uh, in Egypt, he defeated the French fleet and, of course, Napoleon had no way of getting his troops home. All his ships were sunk. What was he going to do? Well, he left behind 30,000 men, many of them diseased and dying, and snuck through the British fleet uh, in the night and went back to France. Now, in his absence, when he was messing around in Egypt, uh, the Austrians, with, with help from Russia, had retaken Italy with huge slaughter and suffering on both sides. So further judgments fell on Italy in, in even Napoleon's absence. He forsook his army in Egypt, returned to Paris, uh, where by turn of events he became the first consul after the coup of 1799. And of course it wasn't too long before he was emperor of France. But there was more blood to drink because Napoleon gathered an army, he crossed the Alps and retook Italy in the campaign of 1800. Now they said that you could not cross the Alps via the St Bernard Pass with a fully equipped army of 60,000 carrying not only their weapons and their gear but also, <coughs> also pulling cannon. Can't do it. Now... You know that Napoleon had an, an artist. Nowadays, of course, politicians carry around with them a press secretary and a, and a bunch of photographers to take the, the photographs so that they can have a historical record for themselves and, of course, to publicise to the world. Well, he didn't have cameras. So what did he do? He took his own artist wherever he went. And the artist here, this is one of the genuine uh, paintings... Napoleon is riding a mule. Now, the reason, reason he's riding a mule is a mule is much more sure-footed than a horse. But, of course, the, the, the painting that went to the French people, he was riding a white stallion. <laughs> Which, you know, nothing's changed, has it, in the world? Nothing. So, he left Geneva on the 8th of May. He arrived unopposed at Milan on the 2nd of June, 1800. The Austrians were defeated at the Battle of Montebello and then again very decisively at Marengo on the 14th of June and forced them to the Treaty of Lundgren. The Austrians suffered immense losses and withdrew, leaving Italy to Napoleon and uh, they were forced into this Treaty of Lundgren, which is in France, by the way, I'll pass through that in the train, on the 8th of January 1801. And it brought about four years of peace. It was in that four years that Napoleon consolidated his position in France uh, there was a series of plebiscites where he used his popularity as a, as a war hero uh, to uh, bring the people on side and his intention was, of course, to create a dictatorship and to crown himself uh, Emperor of the French, which he did uh, in uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame uh, in Paris on the 2nd of December, 1804. True and righteous judgments had already been poured out upon that Catholic harlot system. The, the French Revolution had dealt with, with Catholicism in France. Napoleon's work had dealt with Catholicism in Italy. Now he's going to spread that a little bit further. He was an unwitting instrument of judgment on the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church. While he fought against them, he enjoyed great success because God was with him. When he turned to fight Britain, Egypt and Russia, he suffered defeat. His campaigns brought untold suffering to Italy, Austria and Prussia. That was a very fitting event, a vengeance for the blood of God's servants and all the anti-papal witnesses who had been persecuted mercilessly by that system in previous centuries. Then came the fourth file. Now the fourth file we read of here in Revelation 16 
uh, in verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun uh, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire and men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory. Now that's a very interesting prophecy because that's all about what happened, basically what happened in the Battle of Austerlitz. Now you're going to see a bit, of, a bit about the Battle of Austerlitz tonight in the, uh, in the movie. Uh, and uh, you'll see how gruesome it was and, and the fact that men were sco- scorched with fire. In fact, Alexander, the young emperor of Russia who was there at that Battle of Austerlitz, wrote later, he said, well, this was the first time I'd seen fire. He didn't read the Bible, probably, not, not to that extent. The first time I'd seen fire, he just lost 80,000 men. 40,000 of them drowned in a lake when they broke through the ice and they're trying to escape from Napoleon's forces. So there was a lot of heartache. Men were truly scorched with fire. Now, this vial is poured out upon the sun, and the sun is a symbol of political powers and governments in Scripture, isn't it? The sun of Europe had been the Holy Roman Empire since 800 AD, and the time had come for that sun to be blackened, to be eclipsed. And the work of Napoleon brought that about. Because what happened, of course, was that as he extended his empire, and the blue here is where Napoleon had extended his empire, as he extended his empire, it squeezed the Holy Roman Empire to death. And so what happened was that in 1806, after the Battle of Austerlitz, um, Napoleon forced Francis II, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, to abdicate. And he became Francis I of Austria. One of the reasons why I believe the current Pope's called himself Francis I is that he is setting out to rebuild the Holy Roman Empire. Because you see, what happened was Francis was Francis II of the Holy Roman Empire, but that came to an end, so he went back to being called Francis I of Austria. That's in 1806, but by 1814 he was back as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in its very, uh, uh, you might say, limited form. He was back, he had his territories back, he had his power back uh, in 1814. There's a restoration to some degree. I think there's a little bit of subtlety in the man that now sits uh, in the position of Nimrod. Uh, in what they call the temple of God in Rome. That's all I'm going to say about the first five vials. Uh, You'll see a bit more about that later on this evening. Why don't I now turn to the sixth vial? That starts in verse 12. And of course it's all about the drying up of the great river Euphrates, the emergence of the three unclean spirits, and then the gathering of the nations to Armageddon. It's the period that that we're in and we're at the end of. Now, most of you are familiar, of course, with the territory of the Turkish Empire at its height in 1680. It was huge. And, of course, it's called the Great River Euphrates because that's the symbology. We know that in Isaiah 8, verse 7, the Euphrates was known for overflowing its banks. Its waters spread everywhere, just like the Turkish Empire. And the Euphrates has its source, of course, in, in Turkey, in the mountains of Ararat. And so the... The, uh, the Great River Euphrates. Let's shift, let's shift the position, that's all right. I want to make sure I shift that back. <laughs> the Great River Euphrates uh, is the symbol uh, for, the, for the, uh, the Turkish Empire. And of course, Turkey today, and there it is, is very much diminished. It has been dried up. Now, we know what happened. We know how this happened because it happened through the work of Cyrus, didn't it? When Cyrus captured Babylon, Uh, In 539 BC, it was a type of the work of Christ. And you're fully aware of how Isaiah 13, Isaiah 44, 45, 41, 42 speak about the work of Cyrus. He was the the man who was raised up in righteousness. The the AV says the righteous man. He wasn't a righteous man. He was the man who was raised up in righteousness by God from the east to do the work of overthrowing Babylon, the great of the time. And it's therefore, he's he's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And uh, his name means the sun in Persian. In Hebrew, Koresh, and there was an idiot called David Koresh who named himself after Cyrus uh, in Texas. Sorry about that, Tim. Um, but I've been to the place where, uh, you know, that's in, uh, what's the name of that place? Waco, Texas. Uh, David Koresh thought he was Christ, and so he called himself Koresh, the Hebrew word, which, which means like to the air, H-E-I-R. The air, Christ, like to the air. All right. So you, know, you can go on forever about Cyrus. But I want to just make one or two comments that are useful for you in relation to this evening. And that is this, that Cyrus had, amongst others, he had a huge army, but amongst others he had an elite army. His elite army were called the Immortals. There were 10,000 of them. And 10,000 is the biblical number, of course, for a multitude, Christ's multitude. He had 10,000 so-called immortals that wore white robes and many of them rode on horses. Okay, so there's, there's similarities there, isn't there, with what we know is to come for you and me. And this, this force never got less than 10,000 because there's always a waiting list to get in. And so those so-called immortal soldiers who were killed in battle were immediately replaced. But the one thing about them that was different from the rest of the army was that Cyrus made it a point to know them all personally by name. He knew them all by name, just as Christ knows personally all of his army by name. They're written in the book of life. So there's a lot of little things like that about Cyrus that are the truly wonderful type of the work of Christ and the saints, which is shortly to come. And we know that when he dried up the Euphrates, which of course is what this is all about, the drying up of the Turkish Empire, when Cyrus dried up the Euphrates, it created a way, a way into Babylon. And the drying up of the Euphrates was designed to create a way for Christ and the saints against Babylon. And what will be their base of operations? The land of Israel. All right? And the Turks were driven out of the land of Israel in 1917 by the work uh, of the British through uh, General Allenby. Pushed the Turks north, and that was another phase of the Turkish Empire being dried up. And what that did was to create a way which Christ and the saints will use against Babylon the Great to overthrow that system. See the typology of that? You know, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty full on, isn't it? So the harlot will be destroyed because this is the way that Christ and the saints will use to attack them. Just like he dried up the Euphrates of old and his army under Gobrius and Gatidus came in and some idiot had left the brazen gates open and in they went and that was the end of Belshazzar and his company in one night. Hardly a shot was fired and Babylon had been overthrown. And of course, if you come to the end of Revelation 16 and you read about the demise of that system, Babylon the Great. It says there in Revelation 16 and verse 18, There were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, etc. And every island, verse 20, fled away and the mountains were not found. And as we saw in one of our previous studies, this work of judgment uh, was done by great hailstones, the saints, immortal saints, uh, who are sent out to bring that judgment. Now, the language of a mountain, of course, is, is drawn from Jeremiah 51, verse 25. And those of you who, have, and I know some of you have done this exercise, you really want a great exercise. Have a look at Jeremiah 50 and 51. As I mentioned the other day, Babylon, the name, occurs 55 times in Jeremiah 50 and 51. And there are an unbelievable number of allusions and quotations made in the Apocalypse uh, from Jeremiah 50 and 51. It is the roots of the, the apocalyptic section uh, from Revelation uh, 14 on. It's the roots of it. Did you do an exercise along those lines? Yeah, well, what am I talking about? <laughs> so some of you guys have done the exercise already. So this is all happening because great Babylon is brought in remembrance before God. 
Now, I actually took that photograph, standing up there on the top of the, the Vatican back in 2005, looking down towards the top, looking east from the, from the Temple of Janus, uh, the key-shaped building that we saw the other day. In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that was slain upon the earth. That's why these judgments came. And, of course, we know that they will unfold over 40 years. In our study a little earlier, we saw that. But now I want to focus for what's left of this session on the 2060 day. <clears throat> the Holy Roman Empire and, the pap and papal dominion must end by 2060. Now, 2060 is not the time when, when the temple's complete and when Christ has his universal rule prior to that. But, you know, when you're when looking at this era of history, as far as I can see, it is the only fixed date. No one can nominate the year of the return of Christ, but you can be pretty sure about the year in which the papacy and the supporting beast empire will be destroyed. So let's have a look at the evidence of that. Well, you know, Sir Isaac Newton knew that day. And he was a pretty good Bible student. He knew that day. And I'm pretty sure, one of the questions I'd like to ask Brother Thomas uh, later on, and he's resurrected, is, did you ever consider Daniel 7 and the, and the 1260 period uh, from the formation of the Holy Roman Empire in 800 AD. I'm sure you'll say, yes, I did, and I got a piece of paper out, and I added 1260 to 800, and it came out to 2060. But I was living in 1860. That was 200 years away. And there's no way I could bring myself to the conviction that Christ was going to be 200 years away. <laughs> he believed Christ was coming in his era. I think that's what he'll say. But you see... One thing we did learn from Brother Thomas that's extremely important is that you should never interpret Bible prophecy on what you see. You should always interpret Bible prophecy on what you read, not what you see. And that's the big mistake that's made by far too many people. It doesn't matter what's happening right now. If the Bible says it's going to happen, it will happen. I mean, how many people wrote Russia off as being gog? In the early 1990s, you know, when the when the Berlin Wall came down in 89, and then Russia went into, you know, into a meltdown in the early 1990s, how many Christadelphians wrote Russia off as go? Well, it's pretty foolish. Because it's pretty clear who go is, and you just stay with your conviction because what's happening at the present, it's not going to make any difference. To the outcome. Prophecy is the mould into which history is poured. So history will correct itself. History will get back to where it has to be. We don't have to lose any confidence. If you know your interpretation's right, well, stick with it. That's the principle. So Sir Isaac Newton used that principle. Now you know a bit about this guy. He was one of the great mathematicians and physicists of his time. You know, if he'd lived today, he would have been right up there you know, because he would have had tools he didn't have. And he's the man who discovered the seven parts of the rainbow and all that sort of thing. You know, brilliant man. He lived between 1642 and 1727. He had a lot of elements of the truth in his beliefs. He wrote on religion. He rejected the Trinity as unscriptural, predicted 2060 as the year of the demise of the papacy. And in actual fact, most of you will know that you will know Stephen Snowballin, lives over in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah, well, I've been over there and chatted with him. He's actually seen the notation uh, in Sir Isaac Newton's Bible. He's a scholar of Sir Isaac Newton. He, he lectures on him. He's seen the notation in his Bible in Daniel 7, which says something along the lines of, Pope destroyed 2060. And of course, he had to keep that page of the Bible closed when he was in company because <laughs> it wasn't a very popular conclusion to come to uh, in his time. He would have lost his job uh, and his position, but his private pa papers were kept secret for fear of the church, but they were kept. 
and they've been opened up. This, this man was a very good Bible student uh, and he understood 2060. So I want you to come to Daniel chapter 7. So how's your, how you, how's your focus going? You're right, you're right for this? You're up for it? Okay, Daniel chapter 7. Now we're familiar with verse 7 because verse 7 is about the restoration of the fourth empire because it has to fulfil the stamping of the residue of the feet. It's destroyed by Christ in verse 11 of Daniel 7 so it has to be there at the end. But you see it went through history and in verse 8 having been told that it ended up having ten horns because the Roman Empire was broken up by barbarian invasions and these are the ten horns that appear on its head so each of these barbarian entities ended up sharing part of the Roman Empire. What we read here in verse 8 of Daniel 7, when Daniel says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And what's that about? Well, it's about the rise of the Holy Roman Empire. Now this is the western horn. When you come to the little horn of chapter 8, it's the eastern horn. This is the western horn. Chapter 7 of Daniel is about the western empire. Chapter 8 of Daniel is about the eastern empire. You should never confuse them. So, what happened in history was this. The papacy, which in our previous session or two, we considered got support from Justinian and then Focus. Remember that? In 608-16 we had the Fokin Decrees. Well, sometime later in that century, the wheels fell off. Because the Eastern Emperors decided that they didn't want to continue worshipping idols. And so they got rid of their idols out of their churches over in Constantinople. And they wrote to the Pope and said, we've got rid of our idols, we'd like you to get rid of yours. And he said, go jump in the lake. And they said, well, you can row your own canoe then. We're not supporting you anymore. We're not giving you any military support. You're on your own. Well, the Lombards in Italy, there were three Lombard kingdoms to the north of Italy. They said, you beauty. We're going to make this man's life very unbearable. They started to make his life unbearable. And in the end, he was forced to call upon Pepin, king of France, to get some support against the Lombards. So this is how it happened. They fell out with, with the east over idols in the 7th century. Troubled by the Lombards, he called on Pepin, king of France. Pepin, by the way, was the father of Charlemagne. Pepin gave the, came down in the several campaigns, beginning in 754 AD and, and, and uh, finished in 758 AD. He defeated those Lombard kingdoms and he gave those three states, those barbarian states, to the Pope, who immediately created a triple tiara crown. And the triple tiara crown, which is still worn by the popes today, represents the delivery, it's on his head notice, the delivery of the three horns that are plucked up. And those three horns are play, replaced by one horn. That crown looks a little bit like a fat horn, doesn't it? So the three horns are replaced by one fat horn, which has eyes like the eyes of a man. And of course the papacy is called the Holy See, S-double-E. It's got priests everywhere, you know, looking at everything, watching everything. And a mouth that speaks great things. Of course, the mouth has reference to the papal encyclicals, which beyond 1870 were said to be infallible. Now, you can find several encyclicals that actually disagree with each other, which makes them difficult to accept as being infallible. But that's what they say. A mouth speaking great things, which changes times and seasons. So we're in the... Gregorian calendar, yeah, changed times and seasons. So that's this system. But it's come, coming to an end. Now I want you to come to verse 25. We could read verse 23 and 24, which is an explanation of what verse 8 is all about. We might just read 24 for the sake of connection. 
And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first. He shall subdue three kings. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints. The saints there are just the opposition to Catholicism, not, not the saints per se, any opposition to Catholicism. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, so this is the mouth at work, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and a dividing of time. But, and this is the important part, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume it and are destroyed unto the end. And that dominion is given to the saints of the Most High or the people of the saints as they're called in verse 27. And the people of the saints are a separate unit within the so-called saints. The people of the saints here are the immortal saints. Right? They're the ones who take possession of the kingdom. So it's coming in an end. When? In a time, times, and a dividing of time. Now we don't need to go through all the details again, so let's just put them up quickly. We know that this time, that's one period of 360 plus times, that's two by 360, and a dividing, that's half of 360, adds up to 1260. You've got 360 plus 720 plus 180 adds up to 1260 days. And on the day for a year principle, we're looking at 1260 years. In Revelation 11 verse 2, we read about 42 months, 1260 days or years. The decree of focus, granting the papacy, temporal or political power, we considered a little earlier. AD 608 to 610, you add your 1260, you come to the time when Garibaldi pushed the Pope out and he lost his temporal power in 1870. Revelation 11 verse 3, you've got 1260 days from AD 312, the triumph of Constantine, with the assistance of the apostate church, AD 1260 comes down to 1572, when effective witnessing against the system came to an end. 529 to 533, you've got the Justinian decrees, giving the Bishop of Rome headship of the church, AD 1260, you come down to the French Revolution, which took that power away. All right? There has never been a time when the papacy has acquired any power at all that hasn't terminated in 1260 years. And it won't fail for the last time. So there is a fixed date, brethren. I will stand here and make this date. There is a fixed date. It's 2060. So how do we then work out where we sit? And what's going to happen? How do we work that out? And this is where I want you to be very careful, and I'm making these statements very deliberately because this will get around. It's already out there. This will get around. And I don't want the mistake made of people accusing me of certain things. I want to be very, very clear about what we're saying. How long do we have? Well, I don't know. I do not know. But I know it won't be very long. It cannot be very long. We're, as you said yesterday, Robbie, 46 years away from 2060. Now, we know, we think we can be absolutely confident that there will be a 50-year period, based on Ezekiel, a 50-year period from the resurrection of the dead to the time when Christ walks his bride around the house. And that's what happened in Ezekiel, wasn't it? I think most of you are aware of this. You use Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 40. And you can work out that it's a 50 year period from the time that Christ returns to decide destinies, which was in that case the 18th year of Josiah, to the time when Ezekiel is walked around the house and Ezekiel is a representative man. He's not there to represent himself. He represents the saints. He's walked around the house by the builder of the house, Christ. This is the time when Christ takes his bride through the eastern gate and the glory returns to the house and he shows them the house and then reveals them in the house. Is it going to be exactly 50 years after he's come to raise the dead? Now we know that Armageddon occurs 10 years after he comes to raise the dead. You can work that out. So what about this? The papacy will be destroyed, along with its supporting HRE empire, 
that will have been revived in 2060. The only fixed date here. So what are we going to do? Well, we have to shuffle this 50 years, don't we? We have to shuffle it along. It's probably obvious that because we're in 2014, if you add 50 years to 2014, what have you got? 2064. True? So if Christ comes this year and raises the dead, he'll walk his bride around the house in 2064. Okay? Got that? I want you to come to Revelation 19. Now I'm going to repeat this and in actual fact today you're going to get a, a little bit of the principle of recency and frequency. You've heard of that principle, haven't you? John Knowles used to use it on us when we were teenagers. Recency and frequency. That is, the more recent it is that you hear something again, and the more frequently you hear it, the better you're likely to remember it. See? So don't think I'm sort of padding it out. I'm not. I'm using that principle. Because I know there are some things that do need to be repeated. And this is one of them. Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast, read the revived Holy Roman Empire, was taken, and with him, the false prophet, that's the papacy, that wrought signs before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, meaning total destruction, burning with fire and brimstone. <clears throat> and then it says this, And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls, meaning the nations who have submitted to Christ, were filled with their flesh. What's that telling you? Well, I'll tell you what it's telling me. That the destruction of the empire which supports the papacy and the concomitant destruction of the papacy itself is not the last event. It's not the final event of the destruction of this system. There is a period beyond that where the remnant have to be removed. In other words, those people who have adhered to the papacy, right up until the day of its destruction, who have been given two or three or more opportunities to change their mind, to cease to support the papacy, there's only one thing for them, and that's total destruction. But that's going to take some time. Now, we know it's already four years. It's already four years. It could be five, it could be six, it could be seven, it could be more. I don't know. We know it's already four years. So how long, how long is this period? Well, Revelation 19, verse 21. Well, who knows? Christ knows. I don't know. But the length of that period will determine how long we have. So whatever it happens to be, that determines how long we have before he will come. Now, how are you coping with this? Well, I'll tell you some of the conclusions that seemingly intelligent brethren have made. Someone says, well, you're teaching that Christ came in 2010. Come on, please. Give me a break. I'm not a Joe W. They think Christ came in 1914. Give me a break. Use your brain and think. I know it might be new to some people, but think. And if you think hard enough, it will make sense. If Christ comes in 2014, and he might, who knows, he might, then that period will be four years long. The period between the destruction of the Pope 
and the time when Christ walks is bright around the house. If Christ comes in 2015, it will be five years. If Christ comes in 2016, it will be six years. If he comes in 2017, it will be seven years. Got the idea? The only fixed date here is 2060. I am not talking about a year, the return of Christ. But I am talking about how close we are. You work it out for yourself. Anybody here thinks the signs don't indicate that Christ is about to come? Of course you do. You know that he's about to come. We don't know the day or the hour and we would be fools to nominate a year. But we do know that he is at hand. And I'll give you one reason, and there are a thousand of them, I'll give you one reason why he is near. You know what? I mentioned it the other day. Christ made it palpably obvious that we will be taken from times of general prosperity in our world. Is anyone here confident that those times of prosperity are going to last too much longer? America is bankrupt. Europe is bankrupt. Most countries on the earth are in serious trouble. Aren't they? And it won't be very long. And it will go over the edge. There will be a massive depression like that will make the last one in the 1930s look like a Sunday school picnic by comparison. And we'll be the judgment soon. We have to be taken from times of prosperity, not times of poverty. And the world knows that those times are about to disappear. So we ought to know. So we don't know when he will come, and we're confident that it won't be long. Had that one. Let's summarise. The Holy Roman Empire had two important dates at its inception. 758 AD was when Pepin, King of France, conquered three barbarian states in Italy and gave them to the Pope, hence this triple tiara crown. Now, the thing about this is that 800 AD was the time when Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, in the Vatican. Christmas Day, actually, it was. It's a very fitting day because that, of course, is a very important day for Nimrod and Tamils. So, the thing that you've got to recognise about this is that when the power is acquired, it always terminates. You get the opposite within 1260. Now, think about that. This is where the papacy was humiliated because he had to accept that another king could save him. He's humiliated. I believe if you add 1260 to that date, which comes to 2018, that you'll get the reverse. 2018 will be the time when the Pope will get back huge political clout in Europe. Now, that's only, what, four years away? That'll come on the back of the Great Depression, I believe. And then you've got 2060, which is pretty obvious. So, brethren... Keep your head down. It can't be too long.